it was, it was ideally out my door. <laughs> um, so for this, for this uh, seminar, uh, just a little bit of, of, of housekeeping. I think when you arrived, you, you, you ticked a box saying you were here. When you depart, could you tick the next button? Uh, that slaves on, because this helps us meet fire regulations uh, and also means you don't have an even longer form to fill in, uh, uh, which would be the normal thing to just this here. Um, uh, uh, for those of you who weren't in the room a few minutes ago, I put out uh, an attendance list and also a leaflet form on the table just outside here, bar means take a copy. Uh, and I think um, finally in this, this admin stuff, uh, I should record uh, thanks to uh, Professor John Cortez, the Minister of Environment in Gibraltar and his staff here for making this room available. For the, those of you who don't know John, he spent most of his career uh, as an ecologist and conservationist and then was supposed to go into politics. Um, the next um, month, he was the environment minister for Gibraltar. Um, you might like to think in your career path of doing similar things, as, as John says to, to, to other, other ministers being troublesome with conservationists, not, not his ministers, but other territories. Um, you have to be careful, sir, because you, know, you can ignore the NGOs if you like, um, but you might find they then stand for election and defeat you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much mike welcome to everyone who's joined us um, online um, it's um, very good to have you with us this afternoon um, for this webinar on providing an evidence base for conservation in the uk overseas territories my name's dr katie medcalf um, i'm actually convener for syme at the moment uh, for the special interest group in syme um, and we're also working on this Darwin Plus uh, initiative, um, which has helped us fund today. So thank you to Darwin. Um, many thanks to um, Kirsty and the team at Saim for hosting the webinar um, and for Mike and Catherine for all their hard work in sorting it out um, as well um, as, of course, the government of Gibraltar. Very warm welcome to our speakers for this afternoon. Thank them, I thank you all for making the time in your busy schedules to be here with us, especially to Nancy Presco, Lamika Williams and Brian Nakimanko for travelling across the Atlantic from BVI and TCI. <laughs> um, it puts a, a slight perspective on travelling from Peterborough, which has been exceedingly demanding today. In fact, there's a couple of speakers only just walked into the room looking slightly travel worn. Because of this, I've changed the agenda round and the people from Peterborough who only had to travel 70 miles, <laughs> who've only just managed to get here, are coming last because the people from BVI who had to travel several thousand miles were here first. Um, so apologies um, that the order's slightly different to what you're expecting. Um, I'm very excited about this afternoon's cinema, which joins the two groups of people passionate about spreading the word about the UK overseas territories, wonderful biodiversity and marvellous environment. That's CIM's Overseas Territory SIG and the UK, UK Overseas Territory Conservation Forum. Um, we're very pleased to welcome listeners from other overseas territories and also from the GB um, and other parts of the world. Uh, the seminar is possible in its current form due to funding from Darwin Plus Initiative, of which I will tell you more um, later on, and sponsored by Environment Systems, who I work for as well. The format of the meeting is that the talks will last about 15 minutes. We're going to be trying to be quite strict with speakers to try and get them to finish a little before the 15 minutes, so that there's times for questions between each talk. For those of you online, you can type your questions at any time during the talk and um, my two able assistants, Mike and Ida, are gathering the questions up and they'll, they'll put them to us at the end of the talk when there's time. Um, for those of you in the room, uh, if you want to raise your hand in the normal way, um, we'll take questions online first because for those of us in the room, we might have a few minutes after the webinar ends if we need to carry on talking. And online, if you have a question that we don't get time for, please do email um, myself or Mike and we'll um, put your question either directly to the speaker or try and answer it ourselves. So um, that's um, me for the introductions. I've asked my colleague um, Mike to say a very quick word about CIEMS over to Territories SIG. Okay, I will be very brief because um, uh, what uh, is going to follow me will probably be more interesting. Um, but what I did want to say very, uh, very, very briefly is um, 
this is exactly the sort of forum that uh, we think the special interest group is very well positioned to do. It then allows us to facilitate um, the um, a gathering and uh, sharing of information about the overseas territories. And we're really pleased to have some representatives from the overseas territories here today. That's quite unusual. The last uh, webinar that we did um, from the Falkland Islands government offices um, <clears throat> linked uh, the Falkland Islands, St. Helena and ourselves in the UK. Um, this is slightly different. We've managed to get uh, some of our Caribbean uh, uh, participants uh, here, which is unusual, um, but very welcome. Uh, but certainly we would like um, this sort of webinar to reach not just uh, same members in the UK, but participants from elsewhere. And actually that's probably all I want to say, um, uh, because we are very pressed for time. And I think if I stop now, we'll be probably one minute ahead, which is probably a good place to be. <laughs> Excellent place to be. Thanks very much, Mike. So um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, which is now um, Lamika Williams, who's director for the Department of Environment and Coastal Resources in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Lamika. Good morning. Oh, hold on. Sorry, it's morning where I'm from. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lamika Williams. I'm the director of the Department of Environment and Coastal Resources in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, the, the Turks and Caicos Islands, as you may know, is an overseas territory. And I would like to say with Nancy very begrudgingly, we are the most beautiful overseas territory. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we are in the south, we, in the right south of the Bahamas. Whenever anyone asks me where I'm from, nobody knows the little Turks and Caicos. I always have to say, we're a little south of the Bahamas. Uh, we are low, our environment is really low and flat. We don't have any mountains. Um, you can look from one side of an island of the island to the other at any given moment. Um, and if you go to Grand Turk or Sol Key, you'd be very surprised what they call the ridge of our island. So everything, the highest point being in East Caicos, which is a bracket, correct me if I'm wrong, 121 or 51? 57 meters. 57 meters above sea level. Our natural resources, being an island nation and very coastal, our natural resources are mainly based in the water. Um, it is our bread and butter, but in a sense, the only things that we really export are our spiny lobster and our queen conch. As you know that there is currently undecided a review of the Queen Kong populations worldwide, and we ourselves are looking to do a survey of our Kong populations to ensure that we are maintaining the best sustainable methods as it relates to fisheries, ensuring that uh, quotas are within the correct means while still allowing for economic growth. We do have an open and closed season for our conch, which runs from July 15th to October 15th. And uh, we do have quotas set for local consumption as well as international export. Our lobster season is also, our lobsters are actually also seasoned as well. And that is from August 15th to March 31st. However, they are not CITES regulated. They are just interna internally, regionally, um, looked at and seasoned out for our own, like, own conservation. We are uh, econ uh, economic growth in regards to tourism with diving and snorkeling and other ecotourism activities being our major source of income. With that being said, we have a lot of Darwin Plus programs, projects as Katie has mentioned. So our church, our budget, and I don't know this anyone else, the budget for environmental works tends to be not the largest in the <laughs> everyone's struggling, not to be the largest in the grand scheme of budgeting every fiscal year. So as a department to ensure that our conservation works are going on, that our research work is going on, we have developed partnerships over time. And those partnerships have been bred from our Darwin Plus initiatives as well as other EU funding. I will not talk about EU and funding. Any longer, so let's go back to Darwin. <laughs> um, so currently we have uh, seven active Darwin Plus projects, and those are developing our marine and spatial planning tools for Turks and Caicos Islands. So we're looking to map 
our marine space, restoring and safeguarding our wetlands. This is a project we're working with RSPB as well as our National Trust on. <laughs> Sustainable solutions for sargasm, inundation in Turks and Caicos that we're working on with the University of Greenwich. And regional scale marine conservation through multi-territory -ter tracking and frigate birds. Mapping of evidence-based policy recovery and environmental resilience. They're very long, aren't they? Trying to go through. <laughs> so this one is what we are working on with Katie, looking at mapping our environments after major events and how these events are affecting the islands. After several storms we've had, the islands have changed over time with sand and other um, things moving around, how that has changed, how we can um, adapt to those changes as well. And saving the iguana islands and Turks and Caicos, we have an endemic rock iguana that has uh, over time had suffered a lot during the movement of people as well as feral rats and cats. And that is a project we're also doing with RSPB. <laughs> and regional collaboration to achieve sustainable Caribbean fisheries management. This is what we're doing with CFAS looking at our fisheries, looking at how we can help to collect data. Because for us, we found that collecting local consumption data has been an issue. Um, we're able to get the export data really easily, but local consumption, those persons that just go out for fishing of the fat for their families and so forth, getting that information has been uh, um, difficult. So this is looking at another mechanisms and other methods of getting that data and understanding how the fisheries is being utilized by um, persons around the islands. So that being said, the DCR's main focus is to ensure the sustainable use of our natural resources um, and to protect and promote our biodiversity while also ensuring economic prosperity. So we have the task of ensuring that we conserve and protect, utilize the environment sustainably, as well as ensure that we make money. That isn't a lot. That's, <laughs> that isn't hard at all. So to do this, like I said, our islands, um, there are 12 terrestrial reptile species. We're island nation. We have several endemic and native species, and we share a lot of those with our other counterparts around the island, especially the southern Bahamas. So we're doing this through our legislation and policy. So we have several areas that we target in order to fulfill our mandate. And the first one is legislation and policy development. We ensure, we're trying to make sure that the legislation is dynamic, that it also encapsulates the public and what is used historically and culturally, as well as marrying the need to conserve and ensure for future generations. So we're doing this through uh, currently reviewing our national parks ordinance and regulations. We are reviewing our fisheries protection ordinance as well, our coast protection ordinance and our mineral exploration exploitation ordinance. Most people ask us about this one. What mineral do we have? No, we don't have diamonds. We don't have gold, but we have sand, we have quarry, we have all these other minerals that are mined for buildings, for beaches, for replenishment. There's a lot going on in this area at this time. Enforcement. After legal, all the legal work, we have to enforce this, these um, laws and policy. So enforcement is one of our major arms as well. And we are, we have to enforce use of our beaches, use of our national parks, uses of the fishing industry, as well as the use of any natural environment. This includes developments, buildings, hotels, um, homes, all those things that are encroaching and, and having an effect on the environment. Our conservation officers are in charge of ensuring that all these are within the legal parameters within planning as well as our environmental standards. The department also reviews environmental impact assessments for all developments. Um, and through that, we then try to ensure that we have instilled mitigation methods to offset any of the issues or any of the changes that these developments will make to the environment themselves. Public engagement. We have in increased uh, public community engagement over the years, and this is to sort of marry or encourage persons to be aware of the environment, be aware of the importance of the national environment. 
being a, a child that grew up in the Turks and Caicos Islands all my life, I know what it used to look like. And sometimes when I'm driving down the highway, I compare. I don't know, Brian, you do the same. I compare. I remember dirt roads. I remember old coppice trees. I remember pristine, clean, nothing there. Now when I drive about 20 years later, there are seven-story buildings, what I thought would have never happened. Now we're going to a 12-story. There are, you know, complexes and other things that have changed the, the way our environment looks now. Little hills, our mountains, are now being cut down to facilitate buildings and to facilitate um, the growth of our population. So our community engagement has been to increase our input into our community, changing the way people look at the environment, changing the way that they use it, understanding that whilst cultural activities maybe what we did in the past, they might not be what's best for the environment at this time. Case in point, slash and burn farming. Back in the day, it might have been five people doing it. Now we have 105. So the comparison between the two, changing the way persons think, changing the way they actually do things they used to do, and getting to understand best practices and what is needed. Continues on our Darn Plus. I think that's from Pete, sorry. Marine conservation work. Uh, like I said, a part of our uh, work is a lot of marine base. And we have started looking at our conch morph metrics. So we do at ports, we measure, we look at size, weights, quality, gradings. Uh, for export, I don't know if anybody else, under export, the exporters grade their conch according to various sizes and other things. So that is what we're doing. A conch visual survey, lobster monitoring, coral reef monitoring. We're currently doing our agrosol survey now, um, looking at our, our parks, sargasm monitoring, and GIS mapping. And Brian will be talking more about our terrestrial work in our pine control nursery. The Caicos pine has suffered from invasive, an invasive scale insect that has devastated our populations. We are now trying to recover that area, as well as looking at our orchid, um, working with Kew Gardens on the collection of seeds for the Millennium Bank. Future projects, we're looking at tropical important plants, um, orchids, as well as consumption, local consumption of marine products, uh, redrafting our fishery plan, as well as citizen science. So we're looking to really engage the public engagement in what we're doing and get on, on that trend. Being small, we are not thought of as you know, having a lot in regards to the environment because we're very salt based and coastal, but we are home to a lot of things. We are transit to a lot of things. So, and we are very open to a lot of things. So invasive species and all those others are something that we're really looking at and looking at methods to control. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lamika. Are there any questions online? Just give it a second to have a look online. Are there any questions in the room while we're um, battling the online technology? Yes, please. Uh, I have a question, Amika. Um, thank you, lovely presentation. Um, could you describe your uh, aspirations for reviewing the management of uh, national parks? Could you describe it in? Okay. So, so the question was could Lamika describe the um, reviewing the national park monitoring plans. management plans? Yeah. So currently we have over 33 national parks. So we're looking at, looking at the management plans for all of them. So we want an overall comprehensive plan of basics do's, don'ts, what we want to achieve, what we want to accomplish, as well as targeted plans for certain areas. Well, Petey, you know uh, Turks and Caicos rather well. So for example, our Princess Alexandra National Park, which is one of our most popular um, areas, home to the Grace Bay Beach. You know, uh, so those things, we want to have a plan that describes usage, um, carrying capacity, uh, you know, what is allowed, what's not allowed, and how those things are enforced. Um, also for our reserves and sanctuaries, we want to look at how will we allow in um, 
any research activities that we would like to engage in. Um, my group, so for example, migration of birds in certain certain um, our reserve sites and things like that. Those are some of the little, some of the stuff that we want to encapsulate in there, in our national in our parks plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. There's a question coming online, um, which I'm going to read out. Um, so, how do you get support from local fishers who may be excluded from their traditional fishing areas with marine protected area management? Okay. So, we have a, a strong relationship with our fishermen. This is through regular meetings, talking to them at the um, offloading points, at the markets and so forth. And what we've had to do, as I said, um, we had to inform them of what best practices are and how what they do affect their yield. So we try to bring the relationship of um, your fishing and what your changes you need to do in relation to the money you'll profit make in the future. So bringing those two together and explaining that has helped us in regards to excluding uh, fishermen. We have looked at, in our new, under the new order, increasing fishing zones where you're not necessarily taken out of where you historically fish, but it's more of a controlled area. In regards to our fishing, the major issue we're having with fishing is poaching. And this is from other territories coming in and fishing, not using the practices that we promote within our, our country and what they are doing and how that's affecting the fishing product. So that is an issue. But uh, fishermen in the actual uh, protected areas and being able to smart. Right. Thank you very much, Namika. That's great. Great. So um, the next talk um, I'm going to give myself, which is a little talk about um, the use of satellite imagery um, to record changes following hurricanes in TCI and BVI. And this talk just summarised the Darwin Plus project that we're working on, that uh, Namika referred to, which is the snappy title of Mapping for <laughs> Evidence-Based <laughs> Policy, Recovery and Environmental Resilience. My one tip for anybody going for a Darwin Plus bid is work more on a snappy title. <laughs> um, so uh, we're delighted to work with our partners um, from TCI, BVI, um, JNCC uh, on this project. Um, and it's very much about using um, novel data sets, satellite imagery, geographic information system to provide environment, environmental evidence into um, planning and policy decision making. So giving top decision makers who might not know very much about planning and about the environment and how it functions the tools and the evidence to um, make decisions. Um, and unfortunately, the islands were hit by Hurricane Irma and Maria, just as we were bringing the ideas for the Darwin Plus project together. And so one of the key aims then became to track recovery from the hurricanes in a changing climate, um, as well as mapping opportunities to enhance the environment and risks. Uh, and we're doing this by providing training, equipment and knowledge. Um, Environment Systems has designed um, a mechanism to help um, map and model the environment called SENSE, which stands for Spatial Evidence for Natural Capital Environment and um, Evaluation. And it very much shows where the evidence, where the environment is working well, where our mangroves are uh, behaving well and are healthy, um, where we've got good populations of native species, where our agriculture is doing well. And if we can describe where our environment's doing well, we can also look at where the best place to site new activities and development is to maintain that health of our exact environment. And then the third aspect of that is, how can we use the environment to avoid serious issues and risks? How can we use the environment to stop um, landslides or um, pollution instances to help protect our beaches uh, from um, being eroded by the storms and to help as much as possible to mitigate damage from hurricanes. So one of the techniques that we're using um, involves providing data and one of the key bits of data we're providing is satellite imagery. For those of you who don't know very much about satellite imagery, this is an introduction to satellite imagery in two slides. <laughs> so um, how a satellite works uh, can be shown on the, on the sort of um, 
left of the screen. So the sun shines on the Earth's surface and that um, signature is reflected back off the Earth's surface and captured in the satellite. So it's a bit like you taking a camera and clicking and you're getting a red, green, blue image of what the camera's seeing because the daylight's coming into the camera. The brilliant thing about satellite imagery is it isn't just red, green, blue imagery, but it's bands of imagery. And they're not just the pretty picture, the actual physical data. So for every bit of the Earth's surface, we know the value in the green band, the red band, the near infrared band, and in some cases into the shortwave infrared band. And we can draw graphs and we can make indices um, and we can see water absorption and productivity and uh, exciting things like that and make beautiful images like this color, red inf color infrared image of Mig Kacos on this slide. So um, that's optical data. There's another type of satellite imagery and that's called radar data. A radar satellite will actually ping the signal to the surface of the Earth and record what comes back. This um, creates what we call backscatter. It's very hard to think of backscatter in anything you'd normally visualise and it's much better to think of backscatter as though you closed your eyes and were able to run your fingers over the surface of the Earth because what you get is a combination between the texture of the vegetation and its wetness. And that sort of textury sort of feel of the Earth's surface is very much what backscatter gives us. So if you've got black, then the um, signal's being absorbed by water, so you know black is water. Um, a smooth surface um, would be that. A rough, roughish surface, um, we, you get some backscatter, so as the signal hits, you know you get some sort of scatter and that gives a bright signal and, and that might be the sort of um, thicket in this image of mid Caicos here and a very rough surface uh, like a dry forest or something with multiple layers will give a give a darker appearance. Um, the brilliant thing about radar data is it sees through cloud <laughs> and the absolute game changer with satellite images in the last three years is the launch of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 images. These revisit um, the islands every six days, which means that you can um, get cloud-free images perhaps every month, um, sometimes every few weeks, because you've got this very frequent visit of the satellite. And remember, this isn't just a pretty picture. This is actual physical data. So it's a fantastic resource um, for the islands to monitor the change from the hurricane and to go forward into the future. Um, that was a time series of Sentinel-2 images, and it's just two years worth. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, an example of how this works um, can be explained by looking at mangroves. Mangroves have a very important role in coastal defence and in protecting um, infrastructure behind them from storm effects. As the waves come in um, and go up and down and uh, um, have a lot of energy, as they hit the mangroves, the mangroves bend and flick back. As they bend and flick back, the energy of the waves is dissipated upwards. So as a big wave would travel, travel through the mangrove, it would reduce in velocity until it was quite a little wave at the end of the mangrove. So if your house is at the end of the mangrove patch, you might still get flooded in a hurricane, um, but sandbags might help you. If you took the mangroves away, that full force of the wave would come in and then it would go out and pull your house with it. So mangroves are pretty important, really. Um, the BVI was absolutely devastated um, by Hurricane Irma and then Maria came, and it got even worse. So the picture on the right is the red mangroves on the BVI before the hurricanes from the government website. Probably Nancy's photo. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the one on the left is uh, after Irma and Maria and all the red mangroves died. So how can satellite imagery help us track what's going on? Well, we can look at productivity of mangroves. And so the two little diagrams on the end show a satellite imagery coloured up where it's very productive as very bright and where it's not productive as very dark. So you can see the to, um, purple area of mangroves surrounding a pond, a salt pond in the middle and then the sea out to one side. And before the hurricane, the mangrove was really bright white. So all those red mangrove trees, absolutely full leaf, photosynthesizing like mad, doing their thing and being happy. Um, 
the next image is November 2017, which is two months after the hurricanes, and you can see not very productive at all. Um, in fact, as grey as the beach. Um, how this looks in actual numbers, um, you can see on the graph. So before the hurricane, we've got um, productivity values between 0.7 and 0.8. Um, after the hurricane, down to below 0.5. And what's quite interesting, it's almost a year that it stayed at that very low productivity. Um, and it's just now that it's beginning to um, recover. So actually tracking this recovery um, and where it goes next is quite important. And we might even do that this week. That's an exciting extra. Um, <laughs> the policy importance of this is it highlights the key role that man mangroves play in protecting the coastline so that valued by all not every policymaker is into maps and diagrams, especially in island communities, because everybody knows where everything is. So unlike the UK, where we're obsessed with weather maps and where the next front's coming from and how cold it's going to be, and all of us sort of have some sort of map head, even if we don't like them, in, in sort, of the sort of small tropical islands, um, maps aren't that big. But show anybody a graph, or a spreadsheet and they start to get it. So by taking data, turning it into information and then turning it into decisions, you move um, along the value chain and you get people where you want them. And there's a massive problem after the hurricanes because people wanted to clear up the uh, mangroves because they looked unsightly and that would have been the biggest nightmare of all and being able to present data on how um, useful mangroves were was really um, yeah fundamental in stopping people clearing them up <laughs> um, and also as we look at recovery um, different mangroves around the islands are recovering at different rates so that might help us to highlight what intervention is needed it's not just the terrestrial environment the marine environment you can look at satellite images optical satellite imagery sees to about 40 feet about 10 meters in the caribbean and you can certainly look at things like channels um, reef structure and health within that top zone and understand the location of large rafts of sargassum um, not small ones but large ones the size of this room you can track from the satellites all this you can turn into maps and models. So this is models um, of looking at risk to TCI. This is um, erosion risk and where channels might run in storm conditions and where if you had um, large inundations of water from um, a big storm surge like we got in Irma, uh, you might get um, effects on houses. So maps and models are very useful tools for showing opportunities and risks and to help um, policy makers um, understand our environment and the natural capital it provides. And understanding why features are where they are and how to protect them helps us enhance the environment and keep the islands beautiful by nature, which I nicked because it's TCI strapline. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any talk questions from online, Mike? Yeah, there aren't any open questions there. Okay, is there any questions from the room? Hi. Hello, yeah, really good presentation. I just wondered, um, do you have any information from the marine-based satellite? Um, so, um, from Sentinel-2 already? Yeah, that's ongoing. So we um, luckily have a PhD student from um, Newcastle University who's helping us uh, uncover some of the marine data um, for BVI and um, then hopefully for TCI. And we're also working um, with some, um, a professor from Greece um, who's very eminent in the field to understand how much we can transfer information between islands and that sort of thing. So uh, there is um, a great deal that we can do in the marine environment, but only to that 40 foot, 10 meters bit. So it's really the shallow water. Yeah, um, UKHO have flown both islands now, haven't they? Yeah, um, so there is hydrographic data yeah. if, you can get, if you can get hold of it. None, none online. Great. That's good. I hoped we'd make a little bit of time up. So um, 
I'm now going to hand over to Nancy. So uh, Nancy Pesco is um, Deputy Director of the National Parks Trust of Old British Virgin Islands. Nancy. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, Lomika, but I think you might agree that the British Virgin Islands <laughs> is by like, oh, far no, the only two of our hills. So, really, so my talk, I have to say that. She opened the door for that. Yeah. So, my talk, I was asked to talk about natural capital and, and what kind of work we're doing in the BBI. So, I'm going to gloss over. This will be, as we said, satellite mapping for beginners. It's natural capital and really what we're doing in the BBI at the National Park. So, I always kind of open with this picture because for us, this is our daily view. You know, it's the beautiful blue seas, blue sky, green hillsides, and we just take it for granted. But I always ask people, do you expect it's always going to look like that? You know, it's, it's beautiful. This island is great thatch, and you're looking in the distance to Tortola. It's the main island. We have 60 islands and keys. But, you know, this pace of development, I was born in the BBI. I grew up there. And like Omika says, you know, it, it's small islands change happen very fast. And it's not to say development shouldn't take place, and of course it will, but in small island states it has so much impact, which is, you know, everybody, you see the impact. So this is the Bath National Park. This is probably the most iconic image that you'll see of the BVI. If you've ever seen any tourism advertisement, it will always show this. Every, visil, every visitor that comes to the BVI will go here. It's plastered on every poster. So it has a lot of value in itself, just by its, iconic nature of the, if the palm trees, the, the unique granite boulders, the beach. If you want to see the beach looking like that, you have to go when there's no cruise ships in and the people because it's very rare to see, like in the summertime. You know. So, but this is, you know, it's, it's beautiful beaches. We have 21 national parks in the BBI, one of which is the marine park, 20 terrestrial parks. And the Bass is by far our, our most visited of all. It's, you know, we had at least 1,500 people in a day come through there uh, in December this last year. So, because of course, since the hurricanes, getting the tourists back to the BVI has been one of the most important things for, for the economy. Because the main two economies in the BVI is offshore finance and tourism. So, the offshore finance was still able to work post-hurricane because they just all upsticked, went out on the next charter plane and worked remotely from other territories. But the tourism really took a hit. So, as I said, you know, this is what the environment is what's marketed for the BVI. So everybody is coming for the blue seas, the, um, the sailing, we have a massive sailing industry in the BVI. You know, as I said, this is what is the tourism product. We are the product. You know, at the national parks were always under a lot of pressure to have the parks open like after Hurricane Irma. Basically, I would just, I just, we just talked about Irma because we had nothing left after Maria. It was just Irma, just absolutely devastated the BVI. But we were under so much pressure just to get the parks open again because they wanted the visitors back because we needed the money. And of course you understand that, but if, as Lomika says, we, nobody was giving us any money to then to repair the parks and we're still dealing with that now. So the diving as well, this on the left hand side is the wreck of the Rhone Marine Park, it's a Royal Mail steamer. I will say it sank in um, 1800s. Uh, the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, which also had the Titanic, so I say it didn't have a good reputation. <laughs> <laughs> so, and if you've ever seen the film The Deep, that was actually filmed here. So, but it is, it's like the number one dive spot because it's a very easily accessible um, wreck dive. So we're known for, we have over 60 dive sites in the BBI, which we have a mooring conservation program where we put mooring buoys at coral reef sites to stop anchoring. So a lot of what we do is about um, managing the environment for tourism. And this is Sandy Key. This is a beautiful island. It used to be owned by Lawrence Rockefeller. Maybe you might have heard of him. Yes. But he's a very famous philanthropist, but he believed in environmental conservation. And I always like to cite him as well because he was somebody who had a lot of money could have done a lot with these islands but he actually saw the valley he helped start the national park system in the BBI he actually helped buy land to give to the government to create national parks and he, when Sandy Key he had passed away and the estate of Lawrence Rockefeller actually handed over to the national park trust Sandy Key but with a set of conditions of things that could and couldn't take place so now after so I should link back to it, I'm supposed to be talking about natural capital, but basically what we're saying is that the environment is the product. So if you know anything about natural capital, it's about products and services. And so this is what Sandy Key looked like a few months after Irma. It's, it's just not such a pretty idyllic island. So like you go from that to that. So do tourists want to come and see this? And this is what we really thought, we finally hoped tonight, if you've ever seen a forest fire, that is what the British Virgin Islands looked like after Irma, sticks. There was absolutely not one leaf on any tree anywhere. Brown hillsides and sticks. And if you look at Katie's satellite imagery, 
of the BVI, you can see that. We have very steep slopes. We're volcanic islands with just one limestone island, Anagata, and everything was just brown sticks which, you know, we thought, well, maybe finally they'll realize the value of the environment because nobody's coming here to see Rotel. You know, they want to come for the, the same picture that I showed you at the beginning, the blue seas and the green hillsides. So well, maybe now we'll have some value attached to that. So even before the hurricane, we'd started on this project with JNCC and Wolf's company um, doing a natural capital assessment. Our biggest reason for wanting to do it was to actually give the environment some dollar value. We use the US dollar, even though we're a British territory. So we're very weird that we use the, the US dollar. But we wanted to have dollars on the banking sheets of the uh, government accounting. Basically, you look at just the environment is seen as a free resource. It's just seen to be used. All the companies, the dive companies, the hotels, the charter companies, they use it. But who actually is taking care of it and managing it and preserving it, is, that's what we do. But really, should those people be contributing to the management of those sites that they are then benefiting from? You know, in the BVI, they just started an environment and tourism tax. So every visitor, if you come to the VVI, you pay that. It's a, it's a, it's a ten dollar fee, but only well, sixty percent of that goes to tourism product development, and the rest of it is to go to we have a climate change trust fund, and I think the trust we're going to get about twelve percent of it. So you can see even in calling it, they, and they put a picture on the ticket of the bath. So the same bath. So everybody thinks that number one, they're paying our entrance fee, so they come with their little environment tax ticket when they come to the bath. And we have a three dollar fee, which ironically, every time we want to raise our fees, people get very upset and say, "Oh, you know, we're going to lose business." It's like, yeah, but you're all bringing your business here, and if the bar didn't live like this, you wouldn't have anywhere to go. So really, we're trying to actually get something in the budget that, well, what is the environment worth? We've had ship grounding. So there was a, a mega yacht. We have a lot of mega yachts come through the BVI too, and one there was a ship grounding, and it, it ran aground. And it actually, number one, the terrible things about this, it didn't even admit it ran aground. It was only discovered when the boat was in the US Virgin Islands, hauled out, and they were telling the story to somebody else. That, so it basically fled the scene. And then in its hull, it wasn't solid lead, it was lead shot. So there's all these little bits of lead shot was all over the reef and distributed. And so, you know, we, you know the impacts for one, cleanup, because the government spent thousands and thousands of dollars cleaning it up. So it went to court and it's just been a major thing and it's finally been thrown out because, you know, they, the government doesn't want to dis you know, put off the mega yachts from coming, but yet the cost that the government itself has had to take on of cleaning up all this lead shot. And you can't even say that it's, it's definitely not all gone. And then you don't know the impacts of fish eat there. It's lead poisoning, people eat fish there. So, you know, really trying to say, well, what, what is the, the environment worth? And so again, looking at the value of fisheries and reefs, so Lomika talked a lot about that. You know, again, we have a big conch and lobster industry in the BVI. You know, conch and lobster is on the, the menu of every single restaurant in the BVI. It makes you wonder if there's any left in the sea. It really does. So this again is a view of the bath, the view of the dinghies. From sea, we have swim line markers, we have mooring boys. As I said, it's one of the most visited sites in the BVI, um, major charter boat. There's over 800 charter boats in the BVI. And so it's heavily visited by all these people. All those charter companies, then you think, are, are benefiting from the natural environment. And trying to, we need justification for enforcement, better enforcement. You know, we're trying to strengthen our laws, to make sure that we can do fines, having licensing and better regulations for pollution. Because unfortunately, a lot of these boats are not using holding tanks and their sewage is going in the sea. And trying to get stronger legislation for marine pollution is one of the things that, you know, by saying, look, it brings the environment brings in this much in dollars. So, but what are we actually paying and managing it? So before we had the um, mooring boy system, there are basically people anchoring in the reef. And so we have, about 200 mooring boys and 60 sites all around the BVI. And that basically, it helps, but it certainly doesn't stop people anchoring because people can anchor right next to a mooring boy if there's not a law saying you can't. And we, you know, we're try, still trying to get those laws pushed through to give in our new MPA designations because we have a system plan of protected areas in the BVI, uh, which would expand our national parks network and then designate a lot more marine protected areas because basically we manage sites that we actually have no legal authority to and we managed to get away with it for a long time now so we don't crumble too much about it but it just means when you're trying to enforce things that's when it's a bit of a gray area so penalties to environmental damage as i said on land you can see so the, the picture you see on the top right is basically the road cutting so when people um start to develop as i said we're very steep slopes People clear the land. They usually, in the BVI, they say they like to see the land before they develop. They want to see what it looks like. Well, basically, all it means usually is they clear cut everything in sight. 
And then as soon as it rains, all the dirt runs down into the sea. So we talk a lot about ridge to reef, how what happens at the top ends up at the bottom. And so, you know, that affects coral reefs, seagrass beds, and then all the, the pristine beaches, which are so important for tourism. So this is what the bottom picture shows you after a heavy rainstorm. That's all the mud that washes off the hills that goes down into the bays. That's on the north side of Tortola, that picture. And so basically all the guts, these are our waterways inside the hillsides, they're all washing down, flushing all this dirt down into the sea. So under the town and country planning laws, that's where they would have to, they, you only have to do an EIA if it's near the coast or if it's certain size development. So this is just like normal commonplace for, for most developments, because a lot of people don't always pave their roads because they can't afford to. You know, paving is, is very expensive. So talking about the services that the environment provides, so this is called Sea Cows Bay. This is, um, this is before Irma too, I will point out. Just an important little mangrove area, charter company down in the base there. And we talked a little about the importance, Katie said, about mangroves, the flood protection. And this is another mangrove site called Parakeeta Bay. So as I said, our charter boat industry, this is where during hurricanes, it's a marine shelter. So they would put the charter vessels in there to try and protect them from damage. Well, this is what happened after Irma. So we went from that to that, because basically that was like a category, we like to call it category seven, because that was nothing of any extraordinary. It lifted boats up, flipped them over. So this was no ordinary hurricane. The mangroves couldn't have done what they usually would have done, because that has never happened before. This has been a very well proven um, marine shelter for all those vessels. And they're actually, that's the only reason a lot of those companies are allowed to keep their vessels in the BBI in hurricane season, is because they could go to the marine shelters. So we've learned a lot, a lot of lessons learned, but trying to show really what is the value of the mangroves. This is a picture more recent, basically showing after Irma. Still, a lot of the, her, um, the mangroves did die. So, but underneath, like when you walk through that site now, there's a lot of regeneration of mangroves now. So again, it's really important not to clear the mangrove surface, you know, all the dead ones. I mean, yeah, for tourism, they all say it looks unsightly, but, um, it's really important because there is a lot of regrowth. It's just red mangroves are an extremely slow growing species. But the Marine Association, here we are now, two years later, are still trying to get boats out of there and, and get that marine shelter back in order. So basically the services that mangroves and the environment provide to the, to the community is what's so important. And this will be my last slide, because I always like to end on this. When I was saying, and then if we don't value the environment, then what are we leaving for the next generation? This is my daughter. But, you know, and I just always say, because it's our responsibility, we're the keepers and to try and, and manage these sites and make sure that the environments that we see now, or that we saw 20 years ago, will look remotely like that in another 20 years time. And at the pace of development and the lack of enforcement of legislation and the demand for more tourism and development for economies, it's our responsibility. And that's why I say, if we don't speak the language of the economists, then we don't stand a chance. So we have to speak their language and just say as well that the environment is what the people are coming to the BBI to see and all the Caribbean territories. And so it's really important for us to, to make sure that we have some place in the, 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 the budgets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Is there any questions from the room? Hi. Um, I was just wondering, like, how would you go about ensuring that you appropriately value, uh, economic value to ecosystem services, and just ensuring that you're not lowballing yourself in, in a way, how would you go about doing that? So the question was about um, ensuring economic value um, is actual for the mm -hmm. environment. And that's a good question because basically well, what they've done in the past and through the Wolves Company is, is a lot of willingness to pay surveys. So they do questionnaires with tourists. This is just one of the methods that you use. Is to, if the environment looked like this and they show a partially degraded environment, you know, would you be willing to pay X amount? Or if it looked, you know, if you go diving and you see this many fish and this many, you know, live coral, it's all, that, that's how they tend to get the willingness to pay. So how much is the tourist willing to pay? And you can also look at like the tourism value of the dollars coming in. Um, in terms of cleanup, you can look at cleanup damage. Like if there's a fine to, to be able, we wanted to be able to place fines to some of these vessels. And like you say, so you can look at the real costs of cleanup. So, uh, and how long these things take in the long term loss of um, fishing resources. So you can look at like value of fish to the economy. So, but yeah, it's very hard. You're not pulling numbers out of the hat and we want to make sure there's true science behind it. 
So you look at really the value of tourism to the economy, as well as cleanup costs, you know, the pollution costs. And it's, a, it's obviously, it's a very technical way to come about it. And it can't be an arbitrary number, but you have to start somewhere. Because right now, when these laws are drafted, they usually owe $5,000 for this or that. And it's just very arbitrary. And it doesn't reflect the true cost that the environment has to the territory. Thank you. Quickly then, we'll just take one more and then we'll keep, Jackie, you'll keep yours till the end. Yeah. Do you, um, is there room in your assessment for quantifying non-monetary value uh, of your environment, such as health and well-being? Yeah, actually, that's an interesting one, because right now, especially since the hurricane, there's been a lot of burning, because if you can imagine, well, I can't really imagine, but I took you all to the waste site. There's so much cleanup, and so there's so much burning, so there's a lot of smoke in the air, and the, the government is actually right now doing um, surveys of people downwind from where all this burning is. There's been spontaneous fires happening out of where all these piles and piles of rubble is, looking at like how it's affecting asthma, cas uh, cancer. You know, it, it really is, and it's, it's a really tricky one because actually as, as somebody came in my office recently, she wanted to look at the impacts of sewage from vessels on people's health. And again, you have to look at, well, you're looking at records of, from doctors, you know, it's hard to find that information. So it is a gray area, but it's important to reflect it because air pollution and water pollution are, are really two of the biggest mm -hmm. problems that is, uh, that's hard to monitor. But the US Virgin Islands, which is very close to us, I mean, they can smell their, the burning over in the US Virgin and they've complained from the air pollution. So, you know, but it's, it's really, how do you quantify that? I mean, and we collect water off the roofs in the EVI, you know, in cisterns. <laughs> And so maybe checking, we've thought about this, you know, checking the sediment in the cisterns to see what is deposited in there, but, you know, proving where things come from is very hard. And that's always the thing with pollution, whether it's water or air, it's one proving where it's from and two then, but we all know that it's really bad. <laughs> the scrubbers are not on the incinerator, it's bad. And there are other, there are other values associated with that that aren't necessarily health. health well, no, really cultural as well. Exactly. You know, there's a lot of cultural importance mm -hmm. to the sites. And, and just the landscape value of, as I said, that's why I started out with the first slide, of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, you take it for granted. How do you value what that, that view and image of the BVI mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. You know, if it, it was completely, if you go to St. Thomas, I'm sorry, I'm really slating St. Thomas, but... You know, it's the same size island as ours, but their population is double. Our population is about 28,000 people. This is about double. And it's covered in buildings and high rises mm. and, you know, everything, whereas ours don't look like that. So but how do you put a dollar value on the aesthetics as the landscape value? There is some interesting work mm. happening here that we're involved in too, so... Excellent. Really interesting questions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, keep, keep, keep those questions for the end um, and if we get time we'll take them while we've still got the folks online. If not, um, we'll let the folks online go and we'll have a bit of informal discussion at the end. So um, next to Nick. Have we got Nick? Yeah. Yet? We still haven't got Nick. So I'm just going to um, quickly go through Nick's slides um, and go on to our next speaker. Sorry, this was because there was um, um, a, a, an issue on the train from Peterborough uh, this morning, which meant that people were sitting on the train for two or three hours. And we've got the problem again. Hang on a second. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got to duplicate my slideshow somehow. Can anyone remember how to do it? Katie? Yeah. Hello. Um, if you go into full screen again and then display settings and click on duplicate, that should do it. Thanks, Kirsty. It's okay. <laughs> yes, yes, mine, mine just went blank. Mike, yeah. I'd be very pleased to invite you to come and talk about Monster Act, one of those excellent projects that you've been doing. Thank you very much. I presume I can just go left and right on this thing to make it work. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, 
and but also for allowing me time to catch my breath uh, since I was one of the other uh, trained victims this morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about another piece of work we've been doing um, in Montserrat for the last few years um, and um, essentially uh, trying to fill gaps um, in the um, to make information available to the people using it. So it's, uh, it's both to make that information available and also to find out where the gaps are between other studies done. So we've got a slightly bitty approach and we've worked with several collaborators, some of whom are here. Um, and also I should say that to try and reduce the amount of gaps in the future, we've been trying to work with um, others. I won't have time to talk about that, but I know several other people in the, uh, in the room, like Katie, for example, have collaborated with us on various other aspects. Okay, Montserrat, it's one of the uh, Caribbean Overseas Territories uh, in the Western Antilles. Um, I think it's the, for the southernmost of Overseas Territories in the Caribbean. Despite being a tiny island, um, and it really is tiny, um, then uh, it's still very important for, for wildlife. We've got uh, an endemic bird species, an endemic bird subspecies, several um, uh, lesser antilles endemics there. Um, it's got several endemic plant species. That's the brooding volcano in the background there. That was forest before its latest eruption in the, in the late 90s and, and rumbling a bit afterwards. Um, and that's the, that's the extinct volcano. Montserrat Basin is three volcanoes of di different geological age. That's still forest covered, and there is forest covered on the far side of the, uh, of the more recent volcano. As well as the, um, th these endemics I mentioned, lots of endemic reptiles, and also a frog shared just with Dominica uh, now, and it's critically endangered, and it is the mountain chicken, because it tastes rather good, I believe. Uh, there are lots and lots of insects, many of them endemic. Our, uh, our colleagues in um, uh, Montana State University have been working on these, particularly beetles and flies, including describing some species new to science. Uh, I hope you're not going to ask me about those. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so this wildlife is important in its own right. But it's also for the economy, probably even more so than, than BVI and TCI, because there are fewer other um, uh, economic activities. On Montserrat. Um, that's not to downplay your territories. Um, it's also the, the, the vegetation and soil on the hills are the water reservoir. Um, here are some, here's some young tourists um, um, developing their, their skills with the excellent uh, local uh, guide scriber. There's the volcano um, when it was in its active phase. Uh, it was active from 95 and destroyed the capital, and effectively only town Plymouth in 97. And um, it's not been doing too much activity for the past eight or nine years. Um, but the knowledge of these sort of volcanoes is so low, it's a pyroclastic explosive volcano, it's not like a lava volcano, you know, uh, that the southern two thirds of the already small island will not be uh, able uh, for human occupation for the indefinite future. Although there are some bits of habitat there which might be worthwhile. Um, we've had over 30 years involvement with, with Montserrat uh, since before the volcanic eruption and our preferred approach with all the territories generally, um, the, both the overseas territories and crown dependencies, is, is a long-term relationship, whether or not we actually have an active project in a particular territory currently. And this allows a very inclusive approach to work out needs and priorities, such as via our periodic reviews in the territories of progress in implementing the Alabama charters and towards the IT targets. Uh, free, frequent re regional group meetings using Skype nowadays, periodic conferences of confer uh, conservation practitioners in the territories when we can resource those, and organising near annual meetings of the environment ministers or the equivalents from the, from the territories, amongst other things. I'm going to talk mainly about uh, what we've been doing um, recently under a programme called Saving Our Special Nature of Montserrat. You'll work out that the initials can be double purpose there. Um, and um, particularly the first phase of that, uh, which was 2016-2018, which was part of uh, Darwin, Darwin Plus funded, and that had a long title for Darwin. Contrary to um, uh, Kate's experience, we found that Darwin are more likely to give grants when you have a complicated title than a short one. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so keep the complicated title. 
so so that's why we've got two. Well, there's one reason why we've got two titles for our work. Uh, and as as I as I may mentioned, we were trying to fill gaps to make the results available for practical use for policy development, implementation, education, and research. We had four main components of our, our work. The first one was led by uh, Montana State University, which was making externally held data available to inform local decisions and action. And this has resulted in what's called the Monstrat Virtual Museum of Natural History. They collected the material from lots of places where this material was kept, some very old indeed, and um, uh, digitized it, checked it, and put it online. The, the, the platform and the curation uh, are, are not that provide no cost, um, impose no cost on Montserrat, uh, and also they're safe from having to preserve specimens in tropical conditions, which is not easy. We hope obviously to expand that um, from its initial uh, case of beetles and other tertiaries. Uh, the second part was enhance, enhancing integration of environment aspects into physical planning. Uh, and I, I know Joe Treat was going to be. Oh, hello, Joe. <laughs> okay, she's going to check what I say next. <laughs> um, so, our partners in, in Treat Environmental Consultants provided us pro bono two international experts. Firstly, indeed, before that phase, to run a course on the use of EAs. Uh, and secondly, to consult and identify low cost ways to better integrate environmental aspects into physical planning. This is very important in Monstrat. They've got to rebuild their capital, but they've got to do it without damaging the environment, which much of the economy depends on. So uh, that, that was a very um, uh, important element to work. And slowly, uh, as, as inevitable with systems, the recommendations there are being implemented. The third part was uh, looking at the southern area. Um, it's potentially very important for conservation and possibly important for expanding visits on, on a tourism basis or, of high value visits. Um, but people have, been, have lived there for ages. It's important, got important forest and wildlife, but it's threatened by feral animals. The farmers have to abandon animals at the volcano. In fact, the, the only people killed on one by the volcano were farmers trying to provide food for the inhabitants in that phase. Um, there have been previous attempts to address those feral animals, which are um, the main threat that are mainly in southern forest. Um, but these lack local consensus for various reasons. So our aim wasn't to do any work in the south, it was just to get the, the locals to agree a vision for the south, which could then lay the basis for resourcing and undertaking it. And in fact, we, we were able to get that across, not just conservation, but across all stakeholders, uh, there right up to a ministerial level as to what they wanted the south to look like. Sadly, we haven't actually got the funds to implement it yet, but you know, stage by stage. And the fourth was empowering local personnel and small business community groups to take responsibility for conservation, um, especially in respect to invasive plant removal and encouraging new species. Now, we're at a stage where the technology does not allow a total island removal of, of some difficult invasive plants. But what we think we can do, what we now know we can do, is have people adopting bits of the of the island um, to look after it so that it provides a refuge for um, the, the plants and animals so that when technology moves on we can expand out from there. So I just want to give you a few examples of, um, of these. Uh, the first one is at Old Road Bay which is where the Bellum River meets the sea. The Bellum River uh, Valley now is several meters deep in a volcanic outwash and uh, this local developer, Bain Hickson, is building a, a, a bar and golf course, uh, a golf course several meters above the previous golf course. Um, there, and he uh, uh, consulted us about this. Uh, and there in the top right there is our, is our project officer, then project officer, advising on vegetation. And he's going to use the natural um, vegetation in order to provide the greens. He's going to use um, native uh, plants to provide the shelter. And he's also excavated out. Um, down through some of the ash to the old level and it's regenerated some of these coastal wetlands which are a very very limited resource now in Montserrat and as soon as you dig it out the migrant shorebirds started coming in. A second example there is Garibaldi Hill where Tim Orton owns a trunk of tropical dry forest. Uh, tropical dry forest in the area is a very uh, threatened ecosystem and it tends to be lost to buildings and, and, and conservation because it's the easiest place to work, most comfortable place to live is the, the zone of tropical dry forest. Um, so he is busy uh, uh, removing uh, invasive plants from his rather nice patch of, uh, of tropical dry forest and allowing to grow or planting um, 
the, the, the native um, species. And he, interesting, he's found out that it, it costs the same to employ local gardeners to do this as it would have done to bulldoze and replant, which of course is far more damaging to the natural environment. And there, um, another uh, a local community at Cork Hill, which is one of the few areas where they're being allowed back into the northern edge of the exclusion zone, um, but after 20 years of abandonment. And there we got problems where by things like this, this blackberry, and it's not the same as our blackberry, uh, it is an important fruit crop. But if you leave it 20 years, it becomes a rather troublesome invasive. Uh, and then our clearing areas, being a British island, you'll see the first thing they've cleared is the cricket field. Um, but they are working further on from that area in collaboration with our with our program. Uh, we also got work on the on the going with, with teams working on the coast and the inshore waters to clear those, and also the the, the Montserrat National Trust are providing plants from a nursery and also doing education for the kids as well. So what we'd like to maintain and expand that Adopt a Home for Wildlife work. Sadly, we haven't actually got the funding, but you know we keep looking. We'd like to go on to a feasibility study of dealing with the feral animals in the south, once we can get some funding for that. And later on, we'd like to expand the, the Montserrat Virgin Museum of Natural History to other islands and other taxa. Meanwhile, the, the governor is there supporting, and he tends to be using our opportunity, opportunistic visits to keep things rolling, to, man, to maintain momentum, um, uh, to host informal meetings, to help coordinate uh, and encourage conservation on the island. So I know that the ecology is never rich, but this, is, this slide was in my presentation anyway for other audiences. So I'll leave it there to indicate we are still trying to get things rolling. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, yeah, that's really great. Um, beautiful island as well, although I'm not going to get into the beautiful island debate. <laughs> <laughs> are there any questions from the room on, for Mike? No, nope. great. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Um, so Tara, are you okay to come next? Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to introduce Tara Palembe, who's Deputy Director of the South Atlantic Environment Research Institute. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm one of the Peterborough people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really come from Peterborough. <laughs> but I made it. So thank you, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Gibraltar House for hosting, to OTSIG for having us. Um, so I'm going to talk about the South Atlantic Natural Capital Assessment Project. Um, it's been quite a big project over quite a short period of time. So there's a massive um, wealth of outputs that I'm going to skim through in 15 minutes. <laughs> So no detail. If you have any specific questions, then we can go into the detail after. I can point you in the direction of the reports and all of that. But the project, so I'm Tara Palembi, the Deputy Director of the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute, as Katie said. We're situated um, primarily in the Falkland Islands, but we work across all of the South Atlantic. This uh, presentation I stole from my colleague, Ness Smith, who um, was the project manager and has just left us. And there's other slides in here that are pulled from some of the other presenters and authors of the work that we've done during this project. I need to acknowledge the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, represented here by Phil in the back, <laughs> um, who oversaw the project. We have a memorandum of understanding with them to run the project on their behalf, and they also did similar work in the Caribbean. So some, I think I would imagine your BVI NCA work is part of that wider project. Um, that JNCC are running that is funded by the UK government through their Conflict Security and Stability Fund. So now onto the South Atlantic tour. We've been around Caribbean, <laughs> now we're heading down south. Um, it's going to be a high level, a high level whistle stop tour. If you did it in real life, you'd have to jump on little planes like this red one down in the Falklands to go from island to island there or in little boats like this in Tristan to get from the big ship to the island. But we're just gonna look at it on the map. So what are we talking about? Unlike the Caribbean, it is a very small number of islands um, in a very large ocean with populations that make your 28,000 look big. <laughs> so Ascension um, up there in the tropics, 
which Nicola knows very well, having lived there for many, many years. Five. <laughs> um, so Lena here, where I come from, Tristan, um, the Falklands. So from the tropics down to um, the Antarctic Circle. And the total population of all of these islands is somewhere around 9,000. So you're looking at 700 probably. The smallest is Tristan, around 250. The largest is St. Leland, around 5,000, 4,500 probably at the moment. Um, so this project, I think I wanted to point this out at the beginning, was very much stakeholder dread, so stakeholder led. So there was a concept, there was this idea, and um, there was a framework uh, within which the project had to happen. It had to focus on natural capital, um, but what it had to focus on specifically in each of the islands was driven by the stakeholder consultations that formed the first part of the, the project. So I think we like to say that people were at the heart of this project and people were at the start of this project. So what does that mean in reality? For project outputs, it means this list of workshop reports that you'll see on the website. Um, in pictures, it means this, these people, it always seems to be like project by post-it. We have to get away <laughs> from, from the post-it planning, but anyway. So this is down in the Falklands at the startup, um, South Georgia at the startup, San Lena at startup, Ascension at startup, and Tristan de Kuna at startup. So our project manager um, traveled to all of the islands and lived on all of the islands actually. So she spent at least a month living on um, each of the islands some of them two months, and she was based in the Falklands. One of the fundamental things um, before we kind of started doing all of our uh, more in-depth studies and analysis was to make sure that we had some basic habitat maps for all, all, all of the islands that we were looking at. They existed for Ascension and San Lena under previous projects. There wasn't one for the Falklands before, so the first Falklands habitat map was produced under this project. And the Tristan Island habitat map looked something like this and it was updated to look something like this. And this work was done by Environment Systems for us. Um, so now you have this comprehensive <laughs> base level terrestrial habitat map for all of the South, terrestrial habitat maps for all of the South Atlantic Islands. We did look at cultural values. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm bringing this up to the top of my talk because I have too many slides, so I know I'm gonna have to get cut off very early on. So I wanted to talk about this one first. Um, this was an important part of our project. So we looked at, we did um, some cultural value studies across all of the four islands. This was done by the University of Kent. Um, Rob Fish and his team there, who also did some work for the UK NEA as well. So in the competition for beautiful islands, <laughs> <laughs> you will see this was, this is part of the survey that went out to um, all of the residents of the South Atlantic islands. Um, asking them what they see are the qualities of their environments. And you'll see that beautiful features um, in all of them. We do have a little test. I think it's on this one. Yeah. So we had a little test, but I'm not sure if anybody here would dare to <laughs> suggest which of the South Atlantic islands each of these might represent. So while beautiful features in them all, some are, some other words, um, obviously the size of the word is the one that's most frequently um, used. Other words kind of have slightly different emphasis across the different islands. So the three islands represented here are Ascension, San Lena, and um, the Falklands. Ascension on the left. This one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Blue is Falklands. Blue? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Why? Oh, uh, the essential one is barren. Okay. <laughs> and the blue one is windy. Yeah. 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 Everybody's right. Well done. <laughs> and unique also. So that kind of I I I feeling an identity of you know where you are and what you have is beautiful and unique. Right? came out really um, strongly in, the, in, the, in these studies. And then another one was which, which places on the island represents the essence of the natural environment for you. So for the residents of the island, which are the places that represent the essence of the natural environment? Again, these probably only make sense if you know the islands, um, but 
Green Mountain and Diana's Peak are actually the highest points on, on, on the um, St. Lena and Ascension. So there's kind of, you have some inshore or, kind of, or yeah, terrestrial inshore um, representation, and then you, see, you will see the, the bays, ne? which are the coasts and the beaches. Um, this is for St. Lena and Ascension, obviously warmer when you look at the Falklands. These islands represent the offshore islands where most of the wildlife is where you have to get in that little plane and go to. So slightly different um, feeling for what represents the essence of these different islands. <coughs> and then we also did, part of that survey did what um, you were speaking about, Peter, or alluding to around um, health and well-being. And we have here, we kind of ended up being featured in the front of the Penguin News. Um, because what was clear from the studies was that people are happier, or, or there's a correlation. There's, there's, there's a correlation between um, being happy and being outdoors, and that was shown from um, the surveys. The Falklands were excited because um, the correlation was stronger there, even though it's colder. <laughs> they thought it'd be stronger in warmer climates, but actually it was stronger. And this is kind of just showing you outdoor happiness in the four points. <laughs> don't tell don't tell anyone from four points I shared that slide. <laughs> um, and then on San Lena, I guess just to give you some visuals of what those what those natural environments look like, you know, from from the inland to the sea, on ascension, um, these are just some of the top of the mountain, green mountain that was in the in that word cloud before. Um, and on Tristan, some of the, the scenes from there. So I didn't show you the Tristan um, cultural survey before. Obviously the numbers are smaller, um, but we did do some work there. We had some responses from there. As I mentioned, our project manager was on the island for two for, for a month. Um, so this is, this is what people felt was um, important to them from the environment and also what, what, uh, what the environment let me just, yeah, the, so the difference, I think what was interesting in this one was the potato patches. So I don't know if those of you who are familiar with Tristan, but this came up really highly in terms of which part of the environment is important to, to the Tristanians. And the potato patches is the area where people go to from the town, from the village, they go up to the potato patches to do their gardening and to, there's actually a whole social element to it as well. How, how am I doing for my father? It's like, okay. So in terms of tourism, again, um, tourism is an important part of the economies of some of the islands, obviously not to the extent that it is in the Caribbean. But we did some studies around this. So again, a willingness to pay um, for a whale shark tourism, which is just starting up on San Lena, is something that they wanted to, wanted to see um, or, or wanted to understand better with their emerging tourism industry as a result of the airport opening. Um, we did an analysis at the moment um, for their island of how much of the tourism money actually stays on the island at the moment. Um, looking at things like what tourists upload onto social media so that you can get an, an understanding of what they say important and where they go. So all of these techniques, I mean, I'm sure within the room, some people will be familiar with some of them, some of them will be new. So I just want to do a quick flick through of all the types of, all, all the techniques that we used and, you know, they might be of interest. This one was about the value of sports fishing to the economy um, on Ascension. Um, this one was looking at how you could potentially grow tourism on Tristan. Um, we looked at blue carbon value for kelp on the Falklands. We took agricultural statistics and as Katie mentioned, you know, the transition of, from spreadsheets to maps and maps to spreadsheets, we took spreadsheets and put them in maps that hadn't been done before and that was of interest. Um, we looked at risk and this was some work that environment systems did. Um, Tristan, you'll see this is the road actually from the town up to the potato patches and uh, they have landslides that cover this road which is obviously um, devastating for their, for their local economy so it's then expensive to clear the road. So we did, they wanted some modeling to look at what that risk is and how you could predict it. Um, so that's what the model looks like for the island as a whole. And specifically, um, they wanted to also focus on 
what potential risks are for their water source. We also have a toolbox. Out of this whole project, you end up with a toolbox of uh, tools. <laughs> 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 Which instead of uh, hammers and screwdrivers, we have all of this stuff here, which is open source software, which um, for small islands is useful because you don't have licenses and you don't have ongoing costs for, um, for using software to manage all of this data. If we are looking at um, a, an evidence-based approach to planning, you know, all of this data needs to be uh, brought together, it needs to be managed, all of this involves uh, software systems. So we created all of those as, as some of those already existed, some of them we brought into the project, created new ones. And here's a flavor of those. So there's a data portal now on the Falklands where you can find all of the metadata and the data, some of the associated data there. This uses the um, CCAN, which is this open source software. We have WebGIS online maps for most of those overseas territories now so anybody can go in and view. We have um, apps so you can go out in the field and record and all of this uses open source open source software. So in terms of planning for the future, um, we also did all of that and say, okay, now you have all of that, how do you use it to plan for the future? We did that through scenarios where people said, okay, our future in one scenario could look like this. Um, population aging and dying. Um, I can't remember what all these things mean. Uh, cool, yeah increased buildings, all of those things that I guess are fears as well for some of the islands that, you, that you've expressed before. Um, the scenario was isolated and green, so, so none of the economic development, but you know, also maybe um, population decreasing until it's not viable. Um, so these types of things, and then, <laughs> since I only have two minutes, we then kind of show how you can take some of those scenarios plug them into some models, come up with some, with all of that data that's been generated through the project, come up with some opportunities um, if you're looking at grids. So if you want to, for example, expand your crop production, here's some areas where you could do that based on all of that data and based on that being one of the future scenarios that you want to happen. Same for other things, coffee, biofuel, timber. Another tool is constraints. So if you, rather than, opportunities for where you can put things. This is about where can't you put things. So this is a constraints map. <coughs> if you can't put a landfall on San Lino, which needs to, a new one needs to happen in the next 10 years. If you can't put it near the, near the school, near the, on the land that is the slope, X, Y, Z. If you can't put it in all these places, what's left? Um, so all of these types of tools have been developed through the project for planning. Wrapping up, I don't have time. So thank you to <laughs> the people who inputted into this project, into this slideshow. There's a lot more outputs online and on, um, yeah, online in presentations that I can point you in the right direction to. And thank you to our funders. Thank you very much, Tara, for that whistle-stop tour <laughs> around a very large area of, <laughs> of the world. Um, any questions for Tara um, on that? No. Great. Thank, thank you very you much. Indeed. Um, okay. Um, so, um, Nick, if you if you arrived, <laughs> would you like to go next? Um, <coughs> hang on a second, we're just um, waiting for the um, PowerPoint to come together and then I can go to the top here and I can put it on one screen. Great. Over to you, Mike. Um, sorry, Nick. <laughs> sorry. So this is Nick Little Littlewood. He's from the University of Cambridge and their conservation evidence team. Um, mm -hmm. And um, he's going to talk about bridging the research practice divide. Thank you very much, Nick. And do you have time prompts there? Yes. <laughs> I'll give you five and two minutes. Okay, smashing. Thank you. And then I'll wave at you aggressively. 
<laughs> and then the trap door will open. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. Apologies for, for being late. There was uh, problems in the trains today, as um, I'm sure I think some other people were affected by. Um, so I'm um, sorry to have missed the earlier talks, but glad I have made it in time to give this presentation and uh, looking forward to the rest of the afternoon. Um, I've been with Conservation Evidence for just a bit over a year now, um, but I must give thanks to Claire Wordley, um, whose presentation here I have um, shamelessly plagiarised and cribbed most of this from. Um, can I ask, start off with, who here has heard of Conservation Evidence, the project? Excellent. And of those, how many of you have used it in your decision making and planning? A couple of gold stars there, fantastic. Um, we're really keen to find out what people's experiences are with conservation evidence. Obviously quite a few people have seen it but not used it. Um, so if anybody has any experiences to discuss later on, um, I'd be very happy to speak to you about that. Um, but for those who have, uh, who have come across it before, in particular those who haven't, I'm going to tell you a bit about um, the use of evidence in conservation and about the particular project that we run to enable people to make greater use of evidence. So just an outline, three main things I'm going to talk about. Firstly, why do we need to use evidence? Um, secondly, very briefly, I'm just going to talk about how much we use evidence in conservation and conservation decision making. And then I'm going to tell you about the conservation evidence project and the range of resources that we have available online for you to use. So to start off with, not a conservation project, but it's just um, an example of why use of evidence is really important. Some of you may have um, come across this book that was a, the childcare bible in the sort of um, some of the decades, the sort of middle and latter decades of the uh, 20th century. Um, and a couple of passages from this book is to do with recommendations for how to lay a baby down. Um, and the book recommends that there's two disadvantages of putting a baby on its back. Um, first, it, it can vomit and choke on its vomit, and secondly, that there's a risk of getting a flattened head if it turns to one side. Um, and so it recommends placing the baby on its front. Now medicine has really led the way in using evidence um, in its policies and practices, um, particularly sort of since about the start of the 1970s. Um, but um, as most people know now, um, it's far safer to place the baby on their back. Um, but this wasn't adopted as official recommendation for quite some time after the evidence was available that suggested it was by far the best practice. Um, and on a very somber note, it's been estimated that this delay in introducing the evidence into, uh, into childcare has led to possibly up to 10,000 premature infant deaths in the UK. So ignoring evidence can have you know, pretty catastrophic, catastrophic consequences. An example from conservation, um, this is what's called a bat gantry. Um, you may see these things as you're driving along. Um, they're structures that go over the top of the road um, and the thought is that bats, when they're flying around, they navigate along the edges of the woodlands and along hedgerows and things. And if they're flying across the road, they'll fly into the path of oncoming traffic. Um, and the idea is that the gantry bats will fly higher up. This is above the, above the level of the traffic. They'll follow that as a structure to cross the road. Um, and these have been widely adopted in quite a lot of new road building projects. Uh, just last weekend, I was driving up to, uh, between Cambridge and Norwich and the new road that goes through Thetford Forest. I mean, new, I don't know how old it is, but it's, it's the first time I've driven up here in a long time. Um, and it's got several of these structures. Um, but basically the evidence is they simply don't work. Um, bats don't use them. The number of bat fatalities on these roads is not reduced at all. Um, and there's several risks from ignoring the evidence in this case. Firstly, you can get adverse publicity um, for the project managers of this, this form. Of course, the, um, the conservation uh, aim of the, of the structure isn't realized. Bats are like, continuing to die on the roads. Um, it's very costly. I think it's been estimated that there's been something a bit over one and a half million pounds spent on these structures. Um, and also it gives maybe the false impression that the, uh, the risks have been mitigated and it might be a disincentive to look for further actions that might help to reduce bat deaths. So you can see that you know, that there's a, a number of reasons to try to use evidence. Um, conservation is sort of, has been lagging behind other disciplines, so medicine really led the way. And since then, things like policing and the justice system have also introduced evidence a lot into their decision-making process. But the conservation is to use evidence. Well, some surveys have found that um, slightly fewer than a quarter of the UK conservation managers use primary scientific papers. This is the main place that most evidence is published in the first instance. Um, rather better in Australia. I'm not sure what the reason is for the difference there, but Australia's got around two thirds of people doing that. Um, and considerably fewer people using evidence, using the primary scientific papers in most of their decision making. 
in some particular areas, even smaller proportions than that are using evidence um, from primary scientific papers in their planning. Um, and the overwhelming majority of actions in UK conservation management plans are not justified by any scientific evidence. Um, and there's, evidence, there's also um, evidence from these surveys that um, conservation managers are prepared to change um, what they do and what they plan to do if they are able to see the evidence and able to ha have access to the, the best information available. What are the barriers to using evidence? Why don't people do so? Well, just briefly, the primary ones we can think of are a cost. Um, a lot of things are in scientific papers, that many of which are behind paywalls. Few of these days, but still a great deal are behind paywalls and quite expensive to access. Time in doing so, it could take a long time to, to seek out. There's a you know, huge amount of literature out there, and unless you've got the right skills to search for the right information, then um, that can be incredibly time consuming. Scientific papers, of course, are written by scientists for scientists. Um, and although a lot of people making decisions on conservation planning, not all, but a lot, have got a, you know, a scientific training in, uh, in, in terms of a first degree. In many cases, that doesn't equip them to uh, actually make the best use of scientific papers. Um, and even those who are more accustomed to dealing with scientific papers, I'm sure you'll agree that a lot of them are pretty incomprehensible. Um, I certainly struggle with a lot of what I read, even though it's my job to do so. Sometimes there's no studies on the right things, um, you know, a lack of evidence, the, the things that people want to do haven't been tested or haven't been published. Um, and some organisations don't have an institutional ethos of using the primary scientific uh, literature. Some do, and we're trying to improve that at the moment. So the main part is to talk about conservation evidence. This isn't, this isn't the only way, I should stress it, this isn't the only way to use evidence in decision making and planning. Um, but this is the, uh, the project I'm involved with, so I'm going to tell you about what we do and the resources available. Um, it was set up in 2004 to try and um, uh, overcome some of those, uh, some of those barriers to using evidence, um, set up by Bill Sutherland and based at the University of Cambridge. Uh, for those of you who know it, we're based in the David Attenborough building, which is a, a partnership between the university and a whole wide range of NGOs. Um, so it's a really fantastic, vibrant place with a, a, a large amount of conservationists from a wide range of disciplines there. Um, and many of them do get involved in some ways with the project that we run. We are solutions focused, um, which means that we collect evidence on um, how well solutions work. Solutions as in conservation interventions. Sorry, I want my phone to ring. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer it for you. <laughs> Um, we collect evidence on, on conservation interventions or actions as opposed to on threats. There's a lot of literature that will define threats and evaluate threats, uh, and this is all incredibly useful, but we look at the next stage, which is ways to overcome those threats. Um, and it's a good example of conservation optimism. It's a way of actually empowering people to, um, to make changes, uh, to use the best information that's available, um, and we try and make this as widely available as we can for everyone from somebody who's maybe thinking about putting a garden pond or a bird box up to people who will decide on high level policy that might affect a whole wide range of actions across the country or, or, or wider still. I describe conservation evidence, my main way summing it up to somebody who hasn't come across before, I've got a friend who's not involved in conservation, I need to describe it one sentence as, we read the scientific papers so you don't have to. Um, <laughs> and we do this and we structure what we do around, so far, around a range of synopses. So we tended to focus on a species group or a habitat group. And you can see some of the examples here. Well, this is all the ones published so far. Um, ones that might be particularly of interest to some of the folks here. Uh, obviously, I've arrived too late to sort of find out quite what people are involved with. But uh, I imagine that things like amphibian, bat conservation, bird conservation in particular, um, might have quite a bit of relevance to some of the, some of the overseas territories. So I was trying to think of an example that might have particular relevance to, to at least some of the folks here. Um, and the best one I could think of off the top of my head was maybe thinking about seabirds on islands that have got introduced non-native predators, um, rats and, and other potential predators. So you might think, how can we assist those seabirds on that island? Um, we might think about removing the predators. Is it going to work? Is it going to assist those seabirds? Let's look at the evidence that's available. So, 
looking here at the, the bird synopsis. Um, <laughs> you can see here that there's 455 actions. Now, this an action is a single thing that you might do to assist the species or group of species within this chapter. Um, so I've taken bird conservation there, and these all come up. And then to narrow it down in the keyword box there, I put the word rat. Um, and this narrowed it down to 26. And at the top of the list, you might struggle to read that, but I'll read it out. Control mammalian predators on islands for seabirds, and it's based on 18 studies. So we've got 18 different individual, um, mostly scientific papers, but some of them are reports that evaluate the, uh, the, the, the effectiveness of doing this. We click on that further, on that action, and you see you get effectiveness scores. So this is a, if you only got to look at one thing, this is like the overall score on whether this action is likely to work or not. And we've got an overall effectiveness of beneficial, which is based on a breakdown from um, basic effectiveness, whether the action produces the desired outcome or not. Certainty, so some things might have produced desired outcomes, but there's a lot of uncertainty about whether it's always going to do so or about whether the outcome was what was intended. And harms, um, in this case, it's 0%, um, but in some cases, there may be, uh, you know, harm, maybe potential risk of harm, uh, counterproductive. Um, effects for some of the species that you're looking at. Then we've got a series of key messages. I won't read all these out individually, but these basically summarise the main findings from these. Um, how many studies did I say? It was 26 studies. Um, these summarise the main findings from these. Um, tell you how many of them found that um, populations increased or that breeding productivity increased and things like that. Um, and then the crux of it um, is reading down here. If you scroll down, you get a whole series of paragraphs. Each of these summarizes a single study. I say most scientific papers, but there's also some reports in there and things as well. Um, and these are all written to a fairly standardized format between about 150 and 200 words. Um, and the, really you can drill down here and see which ones are relevant to the area that you're interested in, relevant to the species you're interested in, maybe relevant to the, uh, the introduced animal that you're interested in. Um, and if you've really got time, say you've got a high profile project that's gonna cost a lot of money, then we do suggest that you, the, then access the, the original papers. But this is a way of actually identifying which of these studies are going to be most relevant to you, which ones are going to be most useful to actually seek out, pay for if need to be, in order to access. So there's like a whole hierarchy there of, of information um, from that single basic outcome leading all the way through to, um, to sources of information. So it's another way of using this is as a, essentially another literature search tool as well. Um, just briefly, uh, I've only got a couple of minutes left, I think. So um, we've got some updates coming up that might be interesting in the next uh, year or two. So the bat synopsis and bird synopsis are both being updated. The bat synopsis have been updated actually now and is, is now available. The bird one in the next few months. And there's a few more coming up over the next sort of year to year and a half, um, including the mammal conservation, which I'm working on at the moment. So this is terrestrial mammals, um, excluding bats and primates, which we've already covered. Marine mammals have been dealt with at the moment as well. Um, reptiles hopefully coming up next year um, and ultimately we aim to cover the whole range of taxa and habitats um, I say the whole range of marine habitats being dealt with at the moment as well um, I don't know when they're going to be uh, finished but there's certainly there's a team of people working on, on them at the moment so if you don't find what you're looking for right now keep coming back and hopefully in a few you know a few months maybe a year or two's time you might find a whole lot more information that's of relevance um, just going to skip through this really briefly this is a penultimate slide but uh, part of what we do as well as making evidence available is to um, encourage people to test what they do. Um, you know, imp it's important to identify gaps, um, important to make it as easy as possible for people to report on what they do so that we can all learn from that. And one resource we have is the Conservation Evidence Journal, which is not like a normal journal, it's written in plain English. Um, most of the papers in there are written by practitioners and it's a, a free open access way of actually reporting back um, for the wider community on, on what you've done. So the main message is, is that um, solutions focus is key to conservation impact. Um, as I say we look at interventions and solutions mm -hmm. rather than um, trying to redefine threats again and again. Um, the greater the evidence can be synthesized, gives a greater chance of success. So you're more likely to achieve your outcome and more likely to do it efficiently by, um, um, and use the best, make the best available use of the resources you've got. Um, if you can report back on what you do, all the better, and that's the greater uh, greater volume of learning, um, so it can help with this. Um, and we need to be braver about our failures. Um, 
Failures are hard to publish sometimes, they're hard because a lot of journals don't like them, and it's sometimes a bit embarrassing as well. Um, but that's, those things are equally as important as the successes um, in order to um, you know, ensure that the same mistakes are not made again and again. Um, I've got some resources with me, some books and things, so if at the end after the talks, um, you know, if anybody wants to look at any of the any of our outputs, then I'll be very happy to talk to you and show you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. There was an online question, but you answered it, so that's incredibly efficient. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nancy? Yeah, I love the question. That was very interesting, because unfortunately we don't get to read them out online journals and things like exactly what you said, subscription and stuff like that. So do you have um, information to do the Caribbean? Where do you work? Like, would this, are those specific? Yeah, our, our remit is global. Um, so when we do synopsis, the mammal synopsis, for example, is the one I know best about because that's what I've been working on full time for the last year. Our literature search um, is global. Um, there are biases purely to publication biases. So, um, you know, Western Europe, North America, there's a lot of philosophies from there, simply because that's where a lot of things are carried out. Um, we've also got a bias, of course, to do with language, so we mostly look at the English language literature, but we are trying to address that, and we have had people doing certain literature searches in some of the other um, journals in other languages as well, and trying to incorporate them into what we do. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim, hand in heart, that we haven't got unconscious biases in the way that we look for information. Um, but we do try to avoid that, and certainly for the, journal, the key journals we look at, there's no discrimination to do with um, this, you know, the, the, the knowledge of us today. I guess I'm just interested from our perspective, if we wanted to, like when we're writing projects and we wanted to see who else, because we always look at best practice, like not really about the wheel, see who's done it. But we tend to look more in the Caribbean, because yeah. it's, it's very different how you run something in a, in a small island than in a big country. Of course. One, one thing I skipped to actually, I didn't, I didn't point out on the slides, was a little map showing the location of the studies. So you can actually, when you look at an intervention, you can see where the studies are based in. Um, and one thing that we are hoping to move towards in the future, and I can't remember what it is, is there's an acronym and I can't remember what it is, but basically it's an online tool that will try to um, um, you know, dynamically uh, um, interrogate our database. Um, and you can say what you're interested in, you can say what reading you're interested in, and that will give you back information you particularly want. That's not available yet, but it's certainly a work. It's very much a work in progress rather than um, an aspiration in the future. Thanks very much. We're, we're going to have to just take one question from online and then hold the others for, uh, for after um, Brian Lackey's talk. Um, the question online was, um, when referencing, do they reference you or do they reference the original paper? Right. Um, we have a product called What Works in Conservation, which is um, a single volume that gets published every year that is a synthesis of everything in conservation evidence um, and that gives a referencing guideline right. um, but certainly if somebody looks at the original paper as well then you know I think it would be foolish not to reference that as well so I think yeah. it depends how far somebody delves down mm. yeah yeah brilliant thank you very much indeed that's great and yeah I completely agree with you about publishing things that haven't worked as well as things that have worked being equally valued. And last but very, very not least, um, <laughs> it'd be my pleasure to introduce Brian Nakimanko, who's the Environment Officer and Botanist Extraordinaire of Turks and Caicos Island, Naki Okin. Right. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about the role of fire in Turks and Caicos Islands ecosystems and how we're looking into using our mapping systems um, and evidence-based decision making to, uh, to improve that. So Director Williams already covered the Turks and Caicos Islands, very small, about um, under 40,000 people on currently nine or 10 inhabited islands, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from about 30,000 on Providenciales down to two or zero on West Caicos. And we are, East Caicos is uninhabited. And here we are at the lower end of the Lucayan archipelago, which we share with the Bahamas. So I'll talk about the role of fire in the coastal coppice wetlands, the Caicos Pine Yard, and the Casarana Strands. Coastal coppice and wetlands. Um, Coastal coppice typically only burns in very dry season and usually only in palm patches, which quickly recover. 
So this is a coastal coppice. It's called coppice not because people go and cut it, but because the hurricanes cut it and the hurricanes knock trees down, break them off and they grow back. Uh, this is typically sort of two to three meter uh, canopy uh, with lots of mixed vegetation, it's dune back to scrub and lots of palmetto, primarily cocothranex and leucothranex. When those catch on fire, the skirt of the dead leaves burns very quickly, very intensely, and the rest of the habitat is generally left um, unburned. The wetlands uh, that burn occasionally include the uh, rush grass and the sawgrass and the fanagrass marshes, and they tend to burn during the dry season. This particular one is a rush grass uh, wetland. The rush grass wetlands were deliberately burned by crab hunters to flush out land crab and to prevent mangrove and buttonwood growth. And this is Village Pond in Middle Caicos, uh, which is part of Conkbar Caves National Park. It was actually historically managed by one particular crab hunter through burning occasionally, which was not legal. Um, but at the time that he was active with that, there was really no enforcement on the ground. That was about 20 years ago. Um, he's no longer alive, but no one has taken up that, uh, that, that practice. And that's one of the reasons why the buttonwood is moving into the pond quite a bit. Um, but generally, that has, has died out. Fanagrass, um, Spartana patens, is used as a natural material for the local baskets um, that are unique to the Caicos Islands. And uh, they, they are occasionally burned by the, uh, the basket material harvesters, who are different from the basket makers often, um, to renew the stock and to increase the, the stems available. Um, the habitat looks very similar to this. Unfortunately, I, um, the only pictures I had of fenugrass had lots of school children trampling over it, which didn't make it look very good, sorry. Um, Sawgrass, we have lots of patches of sawgrass, but they tend to be in very remote areas. And they can burn in large swaths, but they, bur they burn very quickly and intensely. More commonly, they burn as mosaic habitat in pine yards. Um, sawgrass will burn green, and it burns to 954 degrees centigrade. So it's um, really intense, very quick. It will burn right down to where it sits in the water and about half an inch or centimeter or so over the water level, it will just stop burning. But this is the, the star of the show when it comes to fire in the, in the Turks and Caicos Islands. The Caicos Pine Yard is a fire dependent ecosystem. Um, so I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the historical and disrupted burn cycles and controlled bur burning as ecosystem restoration. This shows the location of, generally, of Caicos Pines historic range in Turks and Caicos, so Middle Caicos, North Caicos, and Pine Key. Pine Key Pine Yard used to be most of the island. Now this is not, any, not pine anymore. I'll talk about why. The Bottle Creek and Ready Money Pine Yard in North Caicos. This pine yard is now gone, and most of this pine yard is gone. There was actually a little bit on the other side of the pond but that was gone long ago. And the Middle Caicos Pine Yard, there are several pine yards there. Um, this one and this one are still relatively intact, the others not so much. So the Caicos Pine, it's Pinus caribea variety bahamensis. It's the foundation species of the pine yard and the pine rockland ecosystem and the national tree of the Turks and Caicos. Pine rockland ecosystem is one that is present in South Florida, the Northern Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos only. Uh, between 2005 and 2010, an invasive insect called the pine tortoise scale reduced the uh, Caicos pine yard by, uh, by the Caicos pine population by over 97%. So this is the, the scale insect, um, what it does to the branches, that's the insect, it's very tiny, just a few millimeters long, but it has an uninterrupted life cycle, whereas it's normally from a temperate habitat and it goes through a dormant phase for eight months of the year. In Turks and Caicos, it breeds constantly, and it kills the trees from the top down. Um, actually, this photo was taken, I think, around 2008 or nine. All of these trees are now down in the habitat because of subsequent hurricanes. So the habitat's changed a lot. Uh, between the uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Q and the Department of Environment and Coastal Resources, we've been working towards saving the Caicos Pine in its habitat since around 2008. Um, this involves a number of 
in situ studies here, they're looking at the um, presence of uh, possible uh, predators on the scale insect and harvesting what they think might be uh, parasitoid wasps. This is our nursery where we do some ex situ conservation work. My coworker Janelle or Flash um, is in charge of the nursery and growing the pines where we have them uh, ex situ. And uh, we also do some education work, and this is an example of, of that. We had an open day in the pine yard on the Caicos Pine Yard Trail. So the Caicos pine and the tropical pine that live on the pine rocklands in general, uh, they are a fire dependent ecosystem. They require fire to continue to be pine yards. So as an example, this is a really good analogy that a um, colleague of mine in Florida uses, where if you imagine a ball on a sort of ski slope like this, and as long as the ball is there, it's not going anywhere. And that, that's fire, that's fire going through the pine yard and burning off the, um, the, uh, the uh, competitive species, the broadleaf and the hardwoods. So the image on the left is, is a stable state of pine as long as fire is continually introduced in and keeps the trees alive. Uh, the second image with the ball sort of teetering on the edge is when fire is reduced and you get the broadleaf growing up and competing with the pine. Um, it competes both with the pine in, in terms of light but also in soil nutrition and it is more efficient at extracting nutrition from the soil, whereas the pine is an ectomycorrhizal tree and requires its fungi to be happy in order to grow, and that's seven different species of fungi that grow on the pine roots. So if we eliminate fire, we have the broadleaf growing up, and the graphic on the right shows what happens as the pine is re reducing, the ball is at the bottom of the hill, we call it an alternate stable state, and it's no longer going to be pine yard. So the historical and disrupted burn cycles, um, generally the fires were ignited naturally by lightning, um, but the Caicos pine's habitat expanded with the arrival of the Lucayan Tainos who were using fire to hunt game from around 700 CE. This is a historical photo when the pine yard was still quite intact. I believe this was in 2006. Um, from the Loyalist era settlement, which was 1789 onwards, the pine yard has been um, deliberately burned uh, for farming and to improve lumber quality. So people have been burning this um, and helping it as, as part of the landscape um, for quite some time. This is just an image of how a pine fire sort of should look. Um, a, low, a low, quick intensity fire, and you can see at the bottom of the pine trunk, this thick bark which has been burned before in another fire it peels off with the heat, so it sheds the fire away from the pine tree, and all but the smallest seedlings will survive that. And that's the line of fire going through, burning off the needles, and getting rid of any grasses, sedges, and broadleaf. However, when the scale insect killed the pine, we had a problem. There was lots and lots of wood on the ground, which there shouldn't be. Uh, large trunks were on the ground. Um, a catastrophic wildfire such as this one in 2005 um, fuel was fueled by those dead trunks and it burned the seed bank and the soil away completely and it prevented the pines reestablishment. So this fire went on for about two weeks in 2005 um, and this was six months after. It burned everything away right down to the bedrock. Um, so what's growing back there is, a, is the green spot you can see is a plant called um, jack switch, Cochorus hirsutus, which doesn't normally grow in the pine yard, but uh, takes opportunity with disturbed ground. It is native, but it's kind of a, a, a sort of a weedy species. Uh, but the pine was completely gone, the soil was gone. Um, this is actually a wildfire image from uh, following us, the scale insect and a sea surge in 2008 from Hurricane Hannah led to a catastrophic wildfire in 2009. Pine cannot stand salt on its roots even though it grows above about six inches above sea level and uh, the fungus is not happy, the pine is not happy and it dies. Um, this actually is an image which was taken in proper a color image but it looks like monochrome because there's nothing organic left in it really, it's just sort of ash. Um, ash and, and, uh, and charcoal, um, there's no more green at all. So this uh, and the other pine fire really reduced the North Caicos habitat to almost nothing. So this shows the extent of that fire. This was the Ready Money Pine Fire here in 2009, and this was the 2005 fire here. 
and the habitat was badly degraded by the, by the pine tortoise scale as well. So just as an example, um, this was the habitat in 2003. Just pay attention to the little wavy line. That's a swap, a, what we call a, a swash, um, which is a um, a uh, cell grass sort of channel. And this is where the fire went. So you can see the there's there's the cell grass channel there. Um, you can see the bedrock is completely exposed from the fire. It just tore everything out. Um, however, we do like to use fire um, to keep the ecosystem going, and when it's controlled, it works very well. So uh, from 2012, we began controlled burning in Middle Caicos, in the Middle Caicos Core Conservation Area, which is about 660 acres of pine, and in the, in the Conquar pine yard, and we use it as a, a tool for habitat restoration. Um, one of the things we do is we cut fire breaks, so all of these red lines symbolize fire breaks where we've cut them. And we first burned here, we second burned here, and then we did another fire down here as well. This is an example of, con of putting the controlled burn on the ground with drip torches and a fully trained ensemble of staff. This was a fire we did in December of 2014. Uh, this is one of our star players, Janelle. Um, we call him Flash is his nickname, but his last name actually is Blaze. So um, <laughs> he's, he's our burn boss. He's very good at it. And he uh, tells, tells you right away if you're doing something wrong. Um, so the fire plots, um, it's kind of fun to cut fire breaks in pine habitat because you get to do great big graffiti um, that you can see from Google Earth. So we have these <laughs> lovely triangles and then this funny wonky one here and another little plot here and then these great big ones down here. Um, so, you know, sort of left my mark um, without telling anyone. I do know someone who actually cuts initials into pine yards, not in Turks and Caicos, um, <laughs> in Florida, where they have lots and lots of habitat. So it does happen. Um, this was three weeks after our first burn. And I just want to point out the trees that are left are very small. And generally, they were not very full to start with. These standing trees have all subsequently died from the scale and then blown down in the hurricane. So in the next photo, that's what they looked like um, just about two weeks ago. And you can see they're much healthier. The trees that were tiny had been this small for over 10 years. And then suddenly after the fire, they grow back up. So it's doing, the habitat is doing much better now. Sometimes we can't burn. Pine Key is a community of um, rather wealthy people who don't like fire going onto their wooden houses. And <laughs> they live in the pine yard. It's the only place in the Turks and Caicos the pine yard is inhabited. And so there we actually use mechanical clearance. When, when I say mechanical, with a cutlass, with a machete by hand, um, not with a machine. And uh, that's the before and after pictures of the clearance. Right after we cleared that, over 90 seedlings came right up. So it does help. It doesn't do exactly what fire does, but it helps. And I'll just quickly talk about Casarina strands. It is an invasive species. Um, it goes into disturbed soils, particularly dunes, and the dense layer of duff and branchlets prevents other trees from growing up. Fire, which burns in the dense duff, it girdles mature trees, but it leads to a flush of new seedlings. And an escaped campfire creates a hazard, hazardous situation when you have to take a trail through there and the fire is burning through. You don't want to get stuck because it can burn for days. Get stuck on the beach. Not the worst place to be stuck. But, um, but it's very easy to stop. You just cut a fire break, and there's flash cutting a fire break, and the fire stops. It's very, very easy. Um, so I just want to point out, this is a Bambara beach where there was a fire years ago. So in 2010, 2015, and then there was a wildfire in 2016. And if you watch what happens to the beach, it killed the Casarana, and slowly, dune plants were able to come back, and the beach is just a little bit healthier. It's very hard to tell with the distance, but the dune plants are coming back. Now, the Casarana is also coming back, but um, we need to try to um, control it. Okay, so there we go. We talked about the coastal compass and wetlands, the Caicos Pine Yard, and the Casarina strands. Um, so we can use fire as a tool. Um, to renew habitats, to protect the pine yard, and also even to control Casarana as long as follow-up control is done as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Matthew, that's brilliant. Has anyone got a quick question um, in the room? Our time is almost up, but we've got time for one quick question. Do you have any more burns planned for me? Oh, the question was, <laughs> did, does Naki have more burns planned? Um, Flash has more burns planned. <laughs> um, we are unable, with the current capacity of staff, we're unable to do safely a burn on our own. We just don't have enough people to do it. We need three separate teams. We need ignition, holding, and communication. We just don't have enough people. We need sort of 10 to 15 people. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> Without a current um, project to fund those people to come in, either from the Bahamas or the US where they're fully trained, we don't have one in the view immediately. But every time we go into this habitat, not this particular one, but the one north of it, uh, recently it was burned in 2012, and we see that it is badly in need of another burn. So. Uh, we'll be working with, um, hopefully, with Jew Gardens again to try to get some um, projects for the future to be able to go out and put more fire on the ground. And it's something that if you're back home and you want to participate with, we are very happy to train. Director Williams has been out on the ground, on the absolute front line. Um, yeah, it is It is a lot of fun. It's dangerous, but it's, it's exciting and it's fun. And, and uh, there's the, uh, it's, a, it's a good day. Yeah. It's hot. It's very hot. <laughs> There's a question here from Ruth that Mike's going to read out. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, Ruth uh, basically says, noted that this is an example where leaving debris on the ground um, has a negative impact. But um, had, obviously um, that compares... Okay, we're saying it's more of a comment than a question, but it's interesting to compare that, that with the mangrove, um, mm -hmm. you very much wanting to leave all that debris, whereas here you, you don't, you want to tidy it up. And yeah. So, um, yeah. How, how do you know when to do which? Right, so pine is not brilliant food for decomposers. Um, you know, most, most things don't like to eat pine leaves because the, you know, things that did are all extinct. Dinosaurs are gone. So, um, <laughs> you know, the, the scale insect likes to suck sap out of them, but nothing really eats them mechanically, like chews them up. Um, they're not very nutritious. And so they sit on the ground and they just build up. Um, this, is, this is something the pine has done for itself, though. Um, it, it wants its needles to lie on the ground and wait for a lightning strike and burn. Um, because it reduces its competition. So the way we do it, um, basically because the habitat is so fragmented, a lightning strike will no longer carry fire through pine because it won't typically go through scrub, which is a mosaic through here, unless it's very, very, very dry, and then it can be catastrophic. And also the fires burn during the rainy season because that's when we get the lightning, not typically during the dry season, although now we're seeing lots of disruptive thunderstorms in December, which is very weird. Um, so that's primarily why we, that's the way that we look at it. We, it's sort of, um, you look at the ground and you see what's growing up, how thick the trunks of the broadleaf trees are getting, whether they're shrubby or whether they're doing a leader trunk to come, to come up. And you look at also the level of grass that's on the ground, how much stuff is piled up. And there's actually a numeric sort of, uh, figure for determining whether or not it's time to put fire on the ground, but it, it becomes something you look at and you say, yeah, this needs to be burned. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, that's great. Um, thank you all very much to all the speakers. Um, it's been great to have you with us. Um, that brings to the end our, our um, video conference part of the day. Um, so thank you to everyone um, who's joined us online uh, and um, particularly to uh, Kirsty and the folks at CIM headquarters for hosting it for us. Um, do I just stop sharing now? Um, that's fine, I'll end the meeting from here. Thank you all very much. No, thank you very much, it's been great. Cheers. Bye. Okay, thanks a lot, bye. bye.